Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you all are having a Gouda meat fuel day. As usual, let me know how you all are doing. Drop a comment below, update me on your carnivore journeys. I am so excited to have you all meet Dr. Elizabeth Bright. Dr. Bright is a 59-year-old osteopath and naturopath, and her focus is on female hormones. She believes that every single female should supplement with iodine. So we'll go in detail about exactly what type of iodine she recommends, how to take it, and why you should supplement with it. In addition to Dr. Bright, I also invite on two of my female coaches, Coach Coach Adek and Coach Cherish. They both currently live the high fat way and have healed so much hormonally with Dr. Bright's approach. So to have them both comment and share their experiences is extremely helpful and valuable to the conversation. And finally, I try my best to invite on all the guests here on my channel to also be guest speakers in my Steak and Butter Gang community. Yes, Dr. Bright will be an upcoming guest speaker in my next Carnivore Challenge. I'll put up the roster on the screen right now so you guys can see who will be the guest speaker panel for the upcoming challenge month. Hi, Dr. Bright. So nice to see you again. Please take a minute to introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Elizabeth Bright. I'm a osteopath and naturopath, and I specialize in endocrine function, specifically thyroid and adrenal issues. And I wrote a book called Good Fat is Good for Women Menopause, which I probably should have titled Good Fat is Good for Women. And now let me invite on Coach Cherish and Coach Adek to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Coach Cherish. I coach with Bella and Coach Adek in the Steak and Butter Gang. I'm super excited to be here. My specialty is um, helping women start carnivore diet, especially if they're coming from a keto or low carb perspective. And Adek. Hi, I am Coach Adek. And like uh, Cherish said, I am one of the coaches on Bella's team. Together with Cherish, I help members start carnivore. I've come from a in a, a long time history of eating disorders mm -hmm. and I've used carnivore uh, to uh, overcome my eating disorder and I'm actually thriving and healing pretty well both uh, body and mind. That's great. So inspiring a deck. So a lot of my audience, I would say 70% of my audience on my channel, uh, they're women, but of all ages. So with this video, I hope to achieve, if anything, just the goal that mm -hmm. eating more fat is beautiful. It's okay. And Dr. Bright, to have you here to explain it is just such an honor. When I first started carnivore, I literally could not help but eat one to two sticks of butter every single day. I was terrified. I was gaining weight, um, but I was feeling so much better day after day. So my question to open up is, is this high fat approach that you teach for every type of woman of all ages too. Yes, because, well, primarily we're talking about stress. So uh, a high fat carnivore diet is going to replenish your stress reserve. Uh, a young woman, an adolescent woman, it's different because she needs high fat because she's making sexual characteristics, which the thyroid is really important for. But she's making these hormones, more of hormones that she wasn't making before. So the high fat approach is going to be important. So she has enough fat in order to make those hormones, sex steroids, specifically in the adrenal glands, more than the ovaries. Unfortunately, a lot of adolescents start dieting then. They get an image of themselves, unfortunately, that they, I mean, I remember, you know, uh, breasts come, all of a sudden you've got breasts and this is new and you have to adapt to it. And unfortunately in our society, you are sexualized immediately, boom, you're sexualized. And a lot of women aren't, or girls aren't really ready for that. Mm -hmm. So because breasts, women are associated with our reproductive organs. That's it. Um, especially with medicine. So we get these breasts, which have serve a purpose. They're also a fat reserve. Um, our hips fill out a fat reserve in order to make sure that we can make those hormones if we decide and when we decide to get pregnant. The only issue would be with a high fat approach for some people might be that they've been avoiding fat for so long that they don't have the uh, digestive mechanics to render the fat soluble to break it down into pieces so that the intestines can absorb it and turn it into all the good stuff energy and hormones etc and that's will happen if you haven't eaten fat for a long time that will happen if you're hypothyroid um so what i usually recommend is either for a short period of time, um, ox bile and hydrochloric acid, 
it's the bile that supposed to be in reserve in the gallbladder that spurts out and breaks down the fat to render it soluble so you can digest it. Your, bi- your, your gallbladder, if you haven't eaten fat, won't have much bile or it will have become hard. And that's why women have their gallbladders taken out because they avoided fat for years. So I would also suggest lots of smaller fat snacks throughout the day. So there's less stress on the gallbladder, less work for the gall- for a, a trophic or, or let's say not used to a gallbladder to have to react to. I would love to also have Cherish and Adek speak on how high fat uh, benefited your lives and your hormones as well. So Cherish, go ahead. I noticed very much what Dr. Bright was alluding to as far as symptoms and, and, you know, doing all the things as a teenager, you know, trying to restrict and yo-yo dieting for many, many years. And, you know, at one point I did lose my period because of orthorexia, over-exercising, right? And Mm -hmm. eating a low-fat diet, chicken breasts with egg whites and trying to get as lean as possible. And just doing that for decades wound up in my 40s just not feeling good now really focusing on the high fat carnivore i just feel so much better i had a cervical ablation when i was in my 40s which caused a lot of irritation um, pain and it wasn't a pleasant experience being a woman, and it made uh, intimacy very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I found that by eating high fat carnivore, it's reversing that, you know, where things have gotten so much better. And we're just talking within a year, we're not talking a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But it's just it, it's like a it's like a miracle <laughs> you can reverse this damage you thought that you were doomed to a life of having to navigate you know your intimate relations with your husband mm-hmm. around this problem you know that doesn't seem to appear in the movies right <laughs> like nobody talks about this stuff in the movies like everybody's just able to jump up and go for it. And uh, that's just not how it is when you're when you get a certain age. And it's because of all the damage that we did to ourselves previously. So I feel fortunate as a mom to have this knowledge now so that I can help navigate my daughter's journey so that she doesn't have to suffer like I did. Wow. And Adek, oh, what impacts have you felt? But it was constantly restricting and, you know, to find a, finding ways to eat less. And you, definitely it was a focus on calories. So, yeah, fat has the most calories, of course. So that was the f- easiest thing, the first thing that will go. That, and the thing is, yeah, I just wanted to be skinny, not because society wanted to. It's just that uh, it was a mechanism to avoid emotions and, you know, and not to f- be able to feel. And that is what I did. I was very, I was just numb. Uh, uh, mentally as well because of the lack of fat. So when uh, I started the carnivore, actually it was the high protein approach on the carnivore diet and I did not feel well. I was actually, it, it just didn't, f- I didn't feel the things that everyone was saying. And I listened to uh, Dr. Amber O'Hearn and Dr. Georgia Eid, up the fats, up the fats. All women need to go up a high, very high fat carnivore. And that's when I felt the changes. And that's when, uh, you know, hair started growing. My mm. skin felt better and definitely mentally went, went very well. I just, a black cloud would just lift up, lift, lift it up. And uh, just being able to feel happy. I didn't even realize I was a person that was allowed to feel happy, just like a somber person. And uh, now I'm, I'm enjoying moments, <laughs> excuse me, moments of happiness that I didn't thought I would allow, that I was uh, allowed to have. Dr. Bright, how did you come across this approach of high-fat carnivore? Did you yourself used to eat low-fat? Definitely when I was a teenager. I was also, you know, 15, trying to lose, trying to look a certain way, trying to have awareness, wear a certain size of pants. And uh, I was um, uncomfortable, but noticed as a sexual object, as a person, you know, the person who was walking by a few months earlier, didn't get cat calls and things like that. Mm-hmm. So um, there was a word that uh, voluptuousness was something that I was avoiding at all costs, not understanding the power of of that, but the power of 
the voluptuousness is the pits and ass, right? So, <laughs> so I didn't want to know part of that because it was associated with, um, it was associated with uh, sexuality. Yeah. And I started eating, I was anorexic for a while, for a few months, not dangerously so, but definitely, you know, bulimic and all that kind of stuff for about a year. Yeah. And then I became pregnant and had an abortion and my body just said whoa no more dieting it didn't i could have eaten a lettuce leaf didn't lose weight so yeah. my endocrine system said that's it we are now focusing on on your health rather than what you and your brain want to do wow. and then i started eating high high fat um when I became menopausal. When you started high, high fat, was that in conjunction with the carnivore diet? I started the carnivore diet a couple of years before. Um, I had been vegan for six months, and oh. um, which was a terrible experience. Yeah. And I went to China <laughs> doing a, you know, I'm a Kung Fu master, so I went to China and I couldn't eat the, my favorite foods in the whole world. And then just went. Uh, went back to eating meat and fish and menopause hit at 52 and I just stopped eating vegetables anyway so I needed more energy and I realized I was drinking a lot of decaf with butter and I just calculated it and I felt so much better mm -hmm. wow yeah I have that extra ounce of respect for Dr. Bright because firstly she's a kung fu master and she speaks Chinese <laughs> Okay. She speaks Chinese. That is so amazing. <laughs> so I know a lot of the audience watching right now, they're already wondering, okay, so what exactly is high fat? What is high, high fat? Um, for our number lovers, is there a ratio or an amount of fat that you can recommend to start off with? Egregious cases. In my book, for instance, I said one, uh, one gram of protein per kilo of body weight and the rest okay. fat. Um, I've now worked out that 80-20 is pretty much the best way to go. It's one, if you eat one gram of protein per kilo of, I, I started with a very quick anti-inflammatory approach because I had people who were in such pain, joint pain and things like that and, and the digestive issues that I wanted to clear up right away and also hot flashes, which seemed to work mm -hmm. to do a sort of extreme high fat. I think I calculated that it's a stick of butter and a pound to a pound of meat. Mm -hmm. But of course it's confusing because how much fat does a meat have, you know, fatty meat. It has, you'd have to have fatty meat and add a stick mm -hmm. of butter. But with my patients, I work it out for them according to their height and build. And I give them a pie chart, 80, 20 or 78. <laughs> you no, know, just, just to try to get it. You don't have to be exact. It, it's it's in, if you're in the range of that high amount of fat to protein. I don't want people weighing their food every time. Right. That's a drag. So if you're staying in the ratio, you will naturally start to once the, your blood sugar is balanced and you don't have any cravings because your blood sugar is balanced. You're basically going to eat that way naturally and. If you're under a lot of stress, you might eat more fat. My personal experience, I started off just eating sticks and sticks of butter because that's all I could think about. It was what I was craving. Mm -hmm. It makes sense because my hormones were wrecked. I was vegan for six years before that. I had no cycle and I had brain fog. All of the uh, the issues that you mm -hmm. get when you eat low fat and when you under eat. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely like an abstainer type of personality and this applies to lifestyle habits as well. So if I were to start tracking, uh, using the scale or counting, I would start obsessing over the numbers. So yeah. I promise myself, because I know myself best, when I go carnivore, I'm going to try to just listen to my body. And somehow that aligned with everything that I heard about Dr. Bright. I remember the first time I heard about Dr. Bright was in the Steak and Butter Gang. I was doing a group with 10 ladies. We were just chatting, talking about carnivore, what we learned. And one of them uh, was your client. She said, by the way, you should look into Dr. Elizabeth Bright. 
Because she literally tells me to eat one stick of butter a day. I was like, who is this person? Because <laughs> she just read my mind. I was literally trying to sell my story to everyone. I got so many questions, honestly, a lot of hate for it. And then so to have somebody, a doctor to refer to every single time I brought up my experience was such a blessing. So I just have to say, Dr. Bright, thank you for your message, for all of your hard work. So, mm -hmm. so helpful. Cherish in a deck, after reading Dr. Bright's book and implementing her approach, how do you guys eat in a typical day? I, right now, I'm, kind of, I'm recovering from the virus that shall not be named. So uh, the food has kind of, the volume has shrunk. Mm -hmm. But if I was um, up to full appetite, I'll give you that. <laughs> uh, if I was up to full appetite, I'd probably do one to two meals a day, depending on the day. Sometimes I feel like one is sufficient and sometimes I need an extra meal. You know, I just kind of go with my hunger cues. I get phantom periods. So I can kind of tell if I'm feeling a little anxious, I probably need a little bit more fat. So I typically have been doing, you know, anywhere from three quarters of a pound to a pound and a half of meat. And then I just put on as much butter as I want. It's almost like a bite with every, you know, with every piece of meat, I take a bite of butter as well. Um, and it's delicious. Out of Dr. Bright's book, there are two different recipes that I combined into one. Um, where I made a fatty latte. So Dr. Bright has a recipe with just butter. And then she also has a recipe with just egg yolks. And I took them both and mashed them together with hot water. <laughs> <laughs> and created this fatty latte, which I actually drank one before this interview. For me, it puts me over the top. It makes me feel really good. It gives me energy. It, um, it's comforting too. Mm -hmm. It just, it's soothing. And it's almost like, you know, it helps you get in tune with your body. Because if I don't, if I don't want the fat, my body is going to tell me, like, I will yeah. literally feel uh, an aversion mm -hmm. to any of these foods if I try to go to eat them now. Mm -hmm. I think that by doing this has really helped correct what decades destroyed, you know, just low fat and all the bad dieting advice. Um, no. I really think that this has helped me tremendously. So I'm just going to continue to listen to my body and prioritize and be fat fueled, protein powered and just <laughs> go for it. That's, that's what I'm going to do from now on. I love it. I love it. For me, uh, it's it's changed. Uh, I've been crying for two years and I started off, like I said, with high protein. And then that just went up and up and up. And I ended up eating about two kilos, two and a half kilos a day. And um, and I think I just felt like yeah, my, my body needed to be filled up. I guess it was empty for all these years, as I call it. And then um, when I read your book, I had a sudden change of appetite. I suddenly couldn't eat the protein as much anymore. It really, <laughs> even just after a bite, it felt like this is, it, it's not, I, I didn't want it, even though I was hungry. And Cherish and I and, uh, and other women coaches in our team decided to uh, experiment with a high fat, more high fat. We read that we had to eat at least a stick of butter. I said, oh, I can do this. I can in, just let's set the proteins aside a bit and mm -hmm. go for the stick of butter. Well, that ended up with <laughs> one pound of beef or meat a day. And two sticks of butter right now, and uh, wow. and yeah, and and again, I'm just it's, you know, having the same um, idea. I just didn't, I just need to fill up. It may have not been a good balance, but mm -hmm. um, it's it's catching up. I'm uh, yeah, with the two sticks, I just need to catch up again, mm -hmm. and I feel great. I mean, I was I did realize about um, I think two weeks ago, I tell, told in the in our meetings that I suddenly realized I don't have any more headaches. Wow. I've had I've been having headaches for all my life chronically and just thought that was just normal again thought it was normal mm -hmm. and uh, and I hadn't had it when I started adding that stick of butter it just it's gone and that's one of just a big relief in my daily life as well oh, that's right um, okay. thank you Dr. Bright I know <laughs> the, awesome. the rest of this hour is just us thanking you Dr. Bright yeah <laughs> <laughs> you change your life wow you have, oh, butter is yeah. putting Tylenol out of business Oh, seriously. <laughs> I wish, boy. Yeah. Another observation that I made about you, Adek, 
I remember when we first started our meetings, you would always yes. be wrapped up in blankets, lots yeah. of blankets on screen. I and I'd be, would. I would always ask a dagger, is it freezing over there in the Netherlands? And she's like, oh, I'm just always cold. Yeah, and then cold. if you look at her now on Zoom, she is never wrapped in blankets. <laughs> look at her, like t-shirts now every day. Yeah. It is amazing. Dr. Bright, very curious about how your clients take and accept this you know, one to two sticks of butter a day, do they try to refuse and do they have difficulty implementing that? We have to talk um, culturally. Italians, absolutely, they think they're going to die. Oh, really? So just because wow. the life without pasta, life without picacho, so no, I don't have any Italian clients because it's just too much of a switch for them. They say, oh, you want me to eat an English breakfast? Because in Europe, in Italy steak and eggs or eggs and bacon in the morning is considered the English breakfast. Mm -hmm. But I haven't had um, any issues with other uh, other nationalities. <laughs> so I have to live here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do I do emphasize that it's a you know first that it's two weeks absolutely beef only um, high fat so fat of that animal or ruminant, you know, it could be elk, bison, whatever, but, but it has to be ruminant because a lot of my patients have autoimmune issues. So that's sort of my approach to that. And I, we talk about uh, removing stimulants, a lot of uh, coffee or stimulants and certain medications will make it difficult to not have cravings. But it seems what, what the magic to me about the fat being magic is that when I'm able to get uh, patients to remove stimulants, upping the fat at the same time, and they don't notice, they don't feel the receptors that are screaming for that drug or that coffee, caffeine or that are not screaming because the fat is quieting them down. I was... You know, the first um, Indiana Jones movie, that's what I say, but yeah. not everybody in the movie remembers it, but there's this point where he there's this, he can only stop this thing from crashing if he uh, removes this big boulder, he has to replace the boulder with something else. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what you're doing. You're these foods that have you that um, you've been craving that have been causing blood sugar imbalances, mm -hmm. imbalances are replaced by a lot of fat, which does the trick. Mm, that's beautifully said. I always say my best trick to fight the sugar cravings, which indeed is a drug, a stimulant, all of it, a substance. Yes. Uh, yes. I always say, eat the butter when you have that sugar mm. craving, when that voice creeps in. So why is butter so effective to satiate and to make us feel calm, energetic, and well-rested? It lowers cortisol levels. There's actually I have papers that they've seen that a high fat approach lowers cortisol levels. Mm -hmm. Stimulants raise cortisol levels. Yeah. A high cortisol state is a nervous, anxious, fight or flight state. And the fat l lowers the cortisol and replenishes the cortisol when it's been abused and overused and there isn't enough anymore. Mm -hmm. So it does both for high cortisol and for low cortisol. The butter has this butter fat has a calming influence in the sense that it's giving you energy that is healthy instead of stimulant energy, which is, you know, nervous energy. Dr. Brett, you have three children. Are they all carnivore? Yeah. Um, my son is a musician. He started having 35. He had started having joint pain in his fingers, went carnivore and went away. He couldn't believe it because, you know, mom. Right. Mom, no. So mm -hmm. it worked. He was carnivore for a long time. He lost a lot of weight. He wasn't able to eat enough protein. So now he adds a tiny bit of carb mm -hmm. just to maintain oh. his weight because he wants to be, uh, have a lot of muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, my youngest, is pregnant. And she's uh, <laughs> carnivore. And my oldest daughter, Lauren, she's also carnivore. Her partner is not. So little bit of difficulty there mm. but she's mm -hmm. always caught she's cooking a lot of meat Good. <laughs> wow for my new carnivores and new viewers who are curious about the carnivore diet i highly recommend that you utilize electrolytes you can either start off by salting all of your meals heavier so that your adaptation phase is not as harsh and unbearable symptoms like headaches fatigue low energy and muscle cramps 
are sure signs that there are electrolyte imbalances going on in your body. If salt doesn't do the trick, I recommend electrolytes. Element electrolytes are high quality and you know exactly what they put in the ingredients. There's no artificial colorings, no dyes, no MSG, it's just the electrolytes. I would go with this teal colored box called Raw Unflavored. As you can see, they measure out the sodium, potassium, and the magnesium, and each packet looks like this. You can throw it in your bag, your work bag, backpack, take it on the go, and take it whenever you need a little pick-me-up. For everyone who's watching, you guys can get a free sample pack. This is what the sample pack looks like with any purchase. As long as you go to the URL shown on the screen, drinklmnt.com slash sbgal. I've linked it down below in the description box as well. And yes, the raw and flavored one is included in the free sample pack. Carnivore pregnancies. Let's talk about that. Yes. So yes. since your daughter is currently pregnant, uh, is she eating very high fat? Is she changing anything during her pregnancy? Most of her friends are, she lives in Glasgow. A lot of her friends are vegan. So as a oh, social wow. aspect, she feels difficulty being full carnivore, which is what she was for many years. And she had anxiety issues and all that's gone. But, but she does eat a lot of meat. She doesn't eat only meat and she eats high fat. That I know. Um, my main concern for her when she was pregnant in the first trimester was besides iodine, I don't know too, brain is built by iodine, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Got to throw iodine in there, uh, was progesterone. So morning sickness is caused by high progesterone levels. When you're pregnant, your body basically has a foreign object in it. So your immune system will try to get rid of it. Progesterone, counters that. So progesterone levels go really high first trimester pregnancy in order to counteract that autoimmune response to a pregnancy. Progesterone also raises blood sugar. So you have blood sugar imbalances. So that's so the nausea. So remember the when I was pregnant years ago, um, they would tell you to nibble on nit Ritz crackers just to eat regularly to balance your blood sugar. So a high fat carnivore diet is perfect to balance blood sugar. When this progesterone arc happens. When breastfeeding is carnivore still safe? That's one of the most popular pregnancy yes. questions. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. What, what, breast milk is full of ketones. Mm -hmm. Your body puts some lactose in it, it's milk. And what would a vegetable be giving you that you would need? Breast milk is made out of ketones, fat, and a little bit of lactose and some protein. Folate. The whole thing with folate, they put folate in, in vitamins, perinatal vitamins, because it's important for the spinal column, the neural tube to be built, right? B12 is why poor women who couldn't get enough meat had um, babies that had neural tubes that didn't develop properly. A scientists found out that there was folate in folate in spinach, mm -hmm. a B, B vitamin in spinach. So they started... Selling this folate is something you had to have with pregnancy, but what you really needed was the B12. If you look at research papers, it's always B12 slash folate, neural tube, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. So it's basically propaganda for folate for people who didn't, couldn't have enough meat. So it's really important to have meat for the baby's central nervous system to be developed. And iodine. <laughs> <laughs> iodine. Okay, so for our audience members who are not familiar with iodine, if you don't mind um, giving a overview of why we need iodine. We need iodine, Lugol's iodine specifically. Yes. The dark one, not the clear one. It's made out of elemental iodine, which is a mineral, and potassium iodide, which is an iodine salt. The thyroid needs iodine to make hormones. So thyroid hormones are T4 is four iodine molecules, T3 is three iodine molecules, T2 is two iodine molecules, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that iodine the body can't make, the thyroid can't make. Um, thyroid hormones and thyroid hormones are really important. The first organ, endocrine organ that is formed in fetus is the thyroid. Wow. We used to be, and we used to live in water so we got our iodine out of water when we moved off, when we came out of water, uh, the creatures developed a thyroid. That was the first endocrine organ developed. In Italy, they all go to the seaside in the summer and they say, oh, I'm getting my iodine. Not enough. 
um, mountains, mountainous areas like Sardinia, Switzerland, had a, a problem with cretinism, learning disabilities. That's how, you know, what it was called at the time. And that was a lack of iodine. The soil didn't have enough iodine in it. So retardation, mental disabilities, learning disabilities, those kinds of things are associated with lack of iodine. Mm -hmm. The breasts need iodine, fibroids, breast fibroids, uterine fibroids. Again, uh, these are tissue, hyperplastic tissues that are expanding like goiter. Tissue expands to gather more iodine. A breast fibroid, the tissue is trying to gather more iodine. A fibroid in the uterus is trying to gather more iodine on the bloodstream, but there's not enough iodine coming. So it expands to get more. And then obviously issues develop. And there is no carnivore food that will give you enough iodine. It is necessary to take it as a supplement. I, I believe it's necessary, not only because there's no carnivore. Well, algae, algae, uh, you get it out of the water, has a bunch of iodine, except it also has arsenic. And it's can't you can't really measure the quantity. And water's really, most oceans are pretty polluted, right? So seaweed has iodine was a source, you know, the Chinese used to cure goiter with seaweed. Problem is that we have, we live in a world with a lot of pollution, a lot of things that interfere with the absorption of iodine, fluoride being one of them, uh, bromide, which is in all breads and things, which we don't eat, but there's another one. Um, chloride is everywhere. These are halides like iodine, and the receptors looking for iodine think that this think it's iodine and they accept them. And then you don't, the little bit of iodine that might be in your diet won't be absorbed. And Cherish, you said that you're currently implementing iodine. How do you take the Lugals? I just got it not too long ago. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I decided to do was um, currently doing three dropper, three little drops um, with about two ounces of water and just chug it down like a shot uh, every morning before I even do anything else. It's the first thing that yeah. I do. Somebody that is, uh, you know, newly diagnosed with, say, Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. you know, when the lab tests come back abnormal, um, is there a recommended amount that they should be trying to aim for as far as lugals? I'm like, what's the next step? A minimum of two drops of 5%. Okay. Minimum, minimum of two drops of 5%. That will, in a healthy person, 12.5 milligrams is what you need day to day to top off if you're already iodine sufficient. The problem oh, okay. is the person is insufficient, but that goes with the whole protocol, you know, getting to know what that person needs is different. Definitely minimum two drops, 5%. And on the bottle, it says you have to put it on your skin as well. Is that, do you do that too? It's just propaganda because you're not, okay. supposed, to, you're not supposed to take it. They are not, I wouldn't be allowed to sell it anymore okay. if they said you could ingest it. Okay. That's from the whole Wolf Tchaikov effect lunacy of the 1940s. <laughs> Very long story. And for everyone who's watching, I will make sure to link the Lugol's iodine, the dark one, down below in the description box if you guys would like a clickable link to it. Let's move on to butter boobs. <laughs> so I know we talked about this <laughs> butter boobs. We're going to move on to labia. <laughs> okay, but we're boobs. working our way down. Yes, <laughs> let's work our way down. Butter boobs was brought up in our guest speaker meeting featuring Dr. Bright here. And sagging skin and stretch marks is something that females are very concerned about, especially after pregnancy during menopause. Uh, women fear that their skin will never tighten up and their stretch marks will only get worse. Uh, could you speak a little bit about sagging skin, stretch marks, how to get butter boobs? It's also a menopausal symptom, right? So they actually have pictures. If you look up menopause, they have a, they have a, uh, some of them will, there, there will be an image of a woman's boobs laterally, you know, from the side, how 20, 30, 40, 50, you know. <laughs> so it's part, it's part of the propaganda. Your boobs do not fall down to your knees when you don't have your period anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Carnivore, high fat carnivore diet is going to give you fat, which gives you elastin, elasticity to the tissue. 
Um, I know a lot of women have had tummy tucks after babies mm. are born. It's a combination. So stretch marks, zinc, B12. I looked at that on my patients. Um, you know, the striae is usually involved in zinc deficiency, which you're not going to see on a carnivore diet. So you're not going to see a zinc deficiency on a carnivore diet unless there's some kind of digestive issue. A high-fat carnivore diet would definitely prevent that from occurring. So let's hear about personal experiences. So me, I have felt that my breasts have grown in size. And what did I change? I ate high-fat carnivore. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't track anything. I didn't limit my calories or my portions. I just ate as much as I wanted, especially the butter. Cherish, how about you? Did you experience any changes in the body? Yeah, most definitely. When I first came to your very first challenge that I joined, um, I was doing keto, which was pretty actually fairly restrictive when I look back at it. I was fine with my weight achievements and my fat loss achievements on keto, but I didn't like the fact that my breasts had completely deflated. Mm -hmm. That was when I felt completely flat and deflated. And, you know, even though I have a wonderful man of 20 years in November and it didn't matter to him, it mattered to me. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing I know is I'm going through my journey. I'm noticing, oh, things are filling back out. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is really good. Okay. I, you know, like my bras are getting filled up again. This is fantastic. So hence butter boobs. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> nice. How about you, Adek? Yeah. Same here. I mean, uh, I, I had like a child like boobs my, all my life and I, I, I didn't, Again, I didn't think, oh, that's fine. I don't. I just don't have big boobs. And uh, re- just going on carnivore, first of all, uh, they started growing, but didn't realize it's just, uh, especially when I changed up to high fat, that's when uh, everything started filling, well, not filling up. They just became bigger. And <laughs> it was scary at first because it's still in my mindset of an anorexic mm-hmm. and anything more is scary. But the, that, was, that was also what fascinated me because I think because of my brain was also healing that I kind of liked what's going on and even, you know, the, the buttocks as well. So it was it, that's voluptuous, like you were, like you were saying yeah. in the beginning, that was, it's a scary word, but mm-hmm. I think because of kind of, and I think because also of the community and the support that we were having and everyone was just cheering on everything with everything, it, it does help to accept uh, what, the, what all the changes that is going on with your body. And, um, and I do like what's going on <laughs> with my body. This uh, actually the first time in my life and then uh, for sure. And this, hence, yeah, butter boobs. <laughs> and and buttocks. I just want to add something to that. Uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Bruce Lee because I was bullied a lot. Mm. And oh. so having boobs and becoming an adolescent, sort of in my brain, how would I be Bruce Lee? I mean, I wasn't even mm-hmm. training people at that time, right? So the woman who you have, it, we don't, we as girls don't get an image of like this woman, this uh, movie coming out now, Woman Warrior, which I'm really excited to see with Viola Davis. Women who are formed and have tits and ass and buttocks, mm-hmm. butter boobs, and are strong and are warriors. We don't get those images. We don't get those role models, or we didn't. I didn't. Now with this movie coming out, girls will. So you can be. You don't have to be Bruce Lee, but you could definitely kick ass. <laughs> I mean, for me, that role model is you. Dr. Bright. (laughs) Beauty and the brains, you have it all. It's just so inspiring to see you in action. Okay, so now let's move even lower. (laughs) (laughs) So libido. Libido is a topic that I personally feel like immersed in the carnivores is just not talked enough about. All ages, I think libido is a very relevant topic. Cherish, if you would like to prompt and ask the questions, feel free to. So I noticed within myself, things as I got older um, were getting irritable. And so that really just will tank a woman's desire, right? Because it's not fun anymore. You know, things are drying up, things are not going the right way. And you know, you're told to use, you know, products, but those products don't even fix the problem. And they really don't take the irritation away, to be quite honest, especially if you have had, you know, a surgical procedure, Um, things can atrophy. And I've talked to a lot of women in our in our group 
about that. And, you know, just tried to be an encourager for them because I know that the higher fat has definitely made an improvement. My gynecologist recommended that I use as far as personal lubricant. I didn't, I don't have to use that anymore, you know, not on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Um, So I'm kind of hoping if you could speak to Dr. Bright, can this high fat approach reverse some of this damage that was done to us for whatever reason? Can we reverse this life that we're supposed to just, you know, shrivel up as we get older? There's a picture that's put out by the world, by our culture, that a woman is no longer viable when she doesn't have her period, right? So because a woman exists to bring forth children, her organ, her reproductive organs are all she is. That's the medical male gaze. That's been forever since Aristotle in my book, I write about it, right? So in the 1930s, when they invented estrogen, I'll get to fixing it, okay? I just want to explain it first. Um, when they isolated estrogen, they were like, wow, how can we use this stuff? It's weak. There must be a re- women are old hags when they don't get their periods anymore when they're menopausal. So we can just use this stuff to reverse the, these things that they already associated with uh, women in menopause. So they started experimenting on young girls who had thin labia, right? injecting them with synthetic estrogen. And they did this at Bellevue Pediatric Hospital, which is famous, infamous for uh, experimentation, medical experimentation done on girls. And another doctor, so that's Dr. Lewis, and another another doctor, Dr. Carnegie, um, injected the labia of girls, again, girls with gonorrhea because they had irritation um, because they had an infection. So, From that time, vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy has been associated with medically with menopause. It's not true. Nobody went around measuring the labia of healthy menopausal women. They didn't do it. Vaginal dryness is caused by high cortisol, so stress, right? In the instance of sexual intimacy, lack of stimulation. So the the actual mechanics of lubrication come from glands in the vaginal tissue. There are several glands um, and they all produce mucus. Mm. Mucus is a juice basically of lubrication, right? And these glands atrophy with birth control. Mm. So Mm. the pill will start the atrophy. HRT will worsen atrophy. The actual thing, the reason they're taking it to not for not to happen is actually causing it. The other thing is that stress will prevent the, mu- the secretion of mucus. If your body's in a fight or flight state, that could be too many stimulants, unhealthy food, not liking the guy, not being turned <laughs> on, all this stuff will prevent will cause cortisol levels they did tests with people who had been abused etc cetera, etc cetera, mm-hmm. and measured the vaginal lubrication the mucus that was secreted in in these cases um another part of it when you talk about ad- atrophy vasocongestion right just like in the penis okay tissue grows because of blood flow into the tissue yeah. that triggers lubrication that triggers the arousal which causes that also triggers the secretion of the mucus so i don't recommend any product because no product can do what your body is trying to do anyway i think that your lifestyle probably did do damage the ablation did damage the carnivore diet the high fat carnivore diet is the best thing that you can do and maybe also check cortisol levels um, because it restores, it balances cortisol levels better than any other way of eating can. A light question there. So in the meantime, we always see on uh, online that people use coconut oil. Can we use butter for lubrication? <laughs> I once went to, I went to see my daughter in Venice when she was in, in college and I didn't have any skin cream and it was really cold and I put butter on my face yes. at night and then I went to bed and we were staying in an Airbnb, I had mites just 
chewed. Oh. Oh, oh my God. Uh, all my family, all the part that was butter. I had bug bites, <laughs> bed bug bites, or whatever they were, little mites. It has nothing to do with what you're asking, but no, uh, it's just it's, 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 yeah, like putting butter in places that maybe it, uh, shouldn't go. It's, yeah, it's a good warning, Doctor Bright. <laughs> wow. wow. Some people swear by liver for libido. What do you think about that? Anything that's hard to get that's that's hard to get and there's less of, they're going to turn into a magic, mm. <clears throat> magic bullet. So liver is per square inch has a lot more nutrition than muscle meat. Mm -hmm. Other than that, that's all it has. And we do know it has a possibility of, if you eat a ton of it, you could get uh, toxic levels of fat soluble vitamins. If we're talking about aphrodisiacs, yes. uh, libido, okay. <laughs> aphrodisiacs, if you think about it, culturally, uh, asparagus is phallic. Oh. Um, oysters look like vaginas. <laughs> Things look like vaginas. I mean, the only thing that's going to improve your libido is having good nutrition. Mm. And that's what the high fat carnivore does. And having adequate um, thyroid and cortisol levels. Mm. Otherwise, they're stimulants. Maca is a stimulant, not an aphrodisiac, it's just a stimulant. And we know that from. People who are, there is a hyperstimulation, which may lower inhibitions, but you won't be able to orgasm. Wow. Wow. Because you're in fight or flight mode. Yeah. Right, right, right. So uh, the stimulants, no. Okay. Don't work. You asked this question, I want to ask. Yeah. He's gone. I recommend <laughs> for libido, I recommend um, lust and tactile stimulation. Oh, I okay. talk about this in my book. 90% of women do not orgasm with penetration. Mm -hmm. There's something called the clitoris and it doesn't get enough attention. It deserves it. It deserves <laughs> the attention. Damn straight. <laughs> penetration is not necessarily going to, in the movies it does, in the male mind it does. Mm -hmm. and the male mind has made all the movies and written all the books, you know, for the past decades but um the clitoris has been ignored because they didn't even know an anatomically it wasn't in a textbook until the 90s the 90s they were going you know people were going to medical school not knowing how big and where the clitoris was this giant not well, giant but large organ beneath the labia well that's why i like rap music because <laughs> when i was a kid i didn't you know, I didn't listen to rap music. I was, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I hadn't been exposed to it yet. No. And uh, what other music, female rap, hip hop, talks about this? Yeah. I would yeah. never have pegged that I'm... in a million years, Dr. Bray. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. You know I would have never pegged you for a rap fan. Not at all. I listen to female I rap. Yeah, that. well, I'll rap now, but hip hop. I, wow. I, mean, I just cannot see you going down the streets. It's to, empowering. In Italy, yeah. listen to Cardi B. Oh. I just. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but years and years of Emmylou Harrison, Lucinda Williams, and I and love I'm really happy to be listening to Cardi B. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome, it. Dr. Wright. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I used to sell adult novelties at yes. one point in my life. So I used to do home parties. So I'm all about that stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all about it. Is oysters effective for libido? No, they just look like vaginas. <laughs> no, they that just have zinc. They have zinc. They have zinc. They have a lot of zinc. Okay. Well, that's you know, good, it's, but... it's just the nutritional bang for your buck in a food that if you're malnourished, you're not going to get it up. Either the clitoris or the penis. And yeah. you won't have you won't be turned on. Got it. Yeah. Nutrition. Wow. So I should wrap up this interview. I don't want to take too much uh, of your time. But but <laughs> I will of course leave it up to the viewers and the audience. If you guys would like me to invite back Dr. Bright for a part two interview, I am more than happy to do so. If you guys have follow-up questions, comment it down below. I'll make sure to note your questions as well. So, Dr. Bright, if someone wanted to work with you, if they wanted more of you, where can they find you? They can write me on my website. 
So they can send me an email, contact him on my website. If you have follow-up questions about anything we discuss with Dr. Bright, please know that she is a regular guest speaker in the Steak and Butter Gang Challenges. She will actually visit in the upcoming challenge month, and you will get to submit all of your personal detailed questions to Dr. Bright ahead of time. She will come visit as a guest live on Zoom to all of the community members, and we will get to hear all of her answers to all of the questions submitted. So it is a good opportunity if you have follow-up questions, if you want to continue learning from Dr. Bright and hear her speak live. Just go to sbgmeetup.com for more details on how to sign up for the upcoming challenge. Of course, Cherish in a deck, please also share where people can find more of you guys. You can find me in the Steak and Butter Gang as well on Instagram and YouTube at Cherishing your health. We also have a YouTube channel called The Butter Dish. Link down below. So you can find me mostly in the in the Steak and Butter Gal uh, gang and in the meetings. Um, I have an Instagram uh, uh, Adek Carnivore and I I promise to be more active on that one and and I love being part of the Butter Dish Gals as well. I have one more question for you Dr. Bright and this will close up the interview on a beautiful note. I love what you say about self-love, self-image for females especially. And because I have more and more younger females watching my videos who struggle with loving themselves where they are right now, what do you have to say about that topic? I think from my experience and seeing my daughters, the more nutritious you're eating and the more your endocrine system is balanced, the more you will love yourself. So I many patients with eating disorders, body dysmorphia, um, how you feel, how you feel. If you feel well, you're more likely to love yourself. So that's why it's so important to eat a high fat carnivore diet. Absolutely. You can't, um, you, you know, healing from the inside out and the top down is not Instagrammable. It's not, you know, it's so kind of have to have a leap of faith that this works might not be see you know might not be what you see in the pictures yes round of applause for dr bright (laughs) i just have to do that oh so good thank Thank you so much dr bright thank you cherish thank you adek for your time bye thank you bye Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this roundtable discussion featuring Dr. Elizabeth Bright. Dr. Bright is on Instagram and on YouTube, and I have linked all of her socials down below. Please go support her. Check her out. She posts a lot of valuable content and videos on her Instagram and YouTube. But most importantly, I recommend that you order her book, which is on Amazon, and start reading it for all of the info and details. The Lugol's iodine that she recommends is also linked down below in the description box. Please do feel free to share this video with fellow females, women that you care and love in your life. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, turn on your bell and notifications down below. I think it's on this side. Just turn on that bell so that you'll be notified for all of my future videos so that you don't miss any of them. And finally, If you want to learn more from Dr. Bright live on Zoom, she will be visiting in my upcoming October challenge. So if you want to attend that Q&A live and submit your questions for her ahead of time, please go to sbgmeetup.com to sign up for the challenge to attend Dr. Bright's live Q&A. In addition to Dr. Bright, I will also be inviting on the rest of the guest speakers on the screen, Dr. Ovedia, Dr. Al Dannenberg, Sarah Franklin, Professor Bart Kay, and Suzanne Strasberger. Please go to sbgmeetup.com to sign up for the challenge. I've also linked the sign up links down below in the description box if you want clickable links. Thank you again for watching. Have a good day, and I'll see you in my next video. SVG out.